Hello, Internet! It's 8 o'clock. Hey, my cameraman here. I've got a munchkin running camera for me tonight because we were all hanging out in my room, laying on my bed. Me and all the munchkins and my wife, we were all just kind of camping out in here, and they were like, can we go live in here? And I was like, sure, but somebody else told the camera. So one of the munchkins, you can you can show your face. One of the munchkins decided to be my cameraman, <laughs> and he keeps moving the camera so that you can't see me. It's which is hard. A problem. There's a munchkin back there. Here's a munchkin that's not really a munchkin, but a Pikachu. All right, show my face. Show my face, booger. The other munchkin's down there by my wife. All right, we are ready for chapter 11, I believe. Bankruptcy. Uh, no, chapter 11 is called Johnny Do It Does It. Okay, back it up, man. People can see right up my nose. <laughs> back up. Goodness. There's like... Goodness, how do you know Josh dances? Because you've seen the boogie. Right. Well, okay, stop. Don't move it like Jake, that, man. People are gonna people are gonna get seasick watching this. Okay, just stand still. <laughs> stand still. You're laughing and shaking. Let me try. I I love my son, but he's not a great camera okay, you're gonna person. Be All right. Horrible Annabelle's gonna try to run the camera. All right. All right, okay, now everybody just sees one eye. There we go, very good. <laughs> This is weird. Charlie. We're never doing this again. This was a bad experiment. Normally, I do it where it's like reverse time. Tomorrow, at you. tomorrow night will be in the room where we're normally at, where I have my little camera stand. Anyway, chapter eleven. Johnny, do it, does it. It's getting awful rough walking," said Dorothy as they trudged along. Button Bright gave a deep sigh and said he was hungry. Indeed, all were hungry and thirsty too, for they had eaten nothing but the apples since breakfast. So their steps lagged, and they grew silent and weary. At last, they slowly passed over the crest of a barren hill and saw before them a line of green trees with a strip of grass at their feet. An agreeable fragrance was wafted toward them. Our travelers, hot and tired, ran forward on beholding this refreshing sight, were not long in coming to the trees. Here they found a spring of pure bubbling water around which the grass was full of wild strawberry plants, and their pretty red berries ripe and ready to eat. Some of the trees bore yellow oranges, and some russet pears. So the hungry adventurers suddenly found themselves provided with plenty to eat and to drink. They lost no time in picking the biggest strawberries and ripest oranges, and soon feasted to their heart's content. Walking beyond the line of trees, they saw before them a fearful, dismal desert. Everywhere gray sand. At the edge of this awful waste was a large white sign with black letters neatly painted upon it, and the letters made these words. All persons are warned not to venture upon this desert, for the deadly sands will turn any living flesh to dust in an instant. Beyond this barrier is the land of Oz, but no one can reach that beautiful country because of these destroying sands. Oh, said Dorothy when the shaggy man had read the sign aloud. I've seen this desert before, and it's true no one can live who tries to walk upon the sands. Well, we mustn't try it, answered the shaggy man thoughtfully. But as we can't go ahead, there's no use going back. What shall we do next? Don't know, said Button Bright. Of course you don't. Well, I'm sure I don't either, added Dorothy despondently. I wish Father would come for me, sighed the pretty rainbow's daughter. I would take you all to live upon the rainbow where you could dance along its rays from morning till night without a care or worry of any sort. But I suppose Father's too busy just now to search the world for me. You know, the the, the one the one thing that's been fairly consistent over five books is the camera doesn't move while I'm reading. Y'all gotta quit moving around all the well, time. Well, it's because I can't see what I'm doing, so I keep looking at it. Just don't move. You're, you, you, got it, you got it in a good spot. Don't move. If you move, I'll let you know. I'll be like, hey, you moved. <laughs> when you laughed, you moved. <laughs> no, really? You keep laughing, you keep moving. <laughs> and we're never doing this again. I'm sorry. They probably can't hear you. They can hear me. Oh. I suppose Father's too busy just now to search the world for me. Don't want to dance, said Button Bright, sitting down wearily upon the soft grass. <laughs> Did I move? Yeah! <laughs> Lots. <laughs> it's very good. It's very good of you, Polly, said Dorothy. But there are other things that would suit me better than dancing on rainbows. 
I'm afraid they'd be kind of soft and squashy underfoot anyhow, although they are pretty to look at. This didn't help solve the problem, and they all fell silent and looked at one another questioningly. Really, I don't know what to do, muttered the shaggy man, gazing hard at Toto. The little dog wagged his tail and said, bow, bow, just as if he could not tell either what to do. Button Bright got a stick and began to dig in the earth, and the others watched him for a while in deep thought. Finally, the shaggy man said, It's nearly evening now, so we may as well sleep in this pretty place and get rested. Perhaps by morning we can decide what is best to be done. There was little chance to make beds for the children, but the leaves of the trees grew thickly and would serve to keep off the night dews. So the shaggy man piled soft grasses in the thickest shade, and when it was dark they lay down and slept peacefully until morning. Long after the others were asleep, however, the shaggy man sat in the starlight by the spring, gazing thoughtfully into its bubbling waters. Suddenly, he smiled and nodded to himself as if he'd found a good thought, after which he too laid himself down under a tree and was soon lost in slumber. In the bright morning sunshine, as they ate of the strawberries and sweet juicy pears, Dorothy said, Polly, can you do any magic? No, dear, answered Polychrome, shaking her dainty head. You ought to know some magic being the rainbow's daughter, continued Dorothy earnestly. But we who live on the rainbow among the fleecy clouds have no use for magic, replied Polychrome. What I'd like, said Dorothy, is to find some way to cross the desert to the land of Oz and its emerald city. I've crossed it already, you know, more than once. First a cyclone carried my house over, and then some shoes brought me back again in a half second. Then Ozma took me over on her magic carpet, and the Gnome King's magic belt took me home that time. You see, it was magic did it every time, except the first, and we can't expect a cyclone to happen long to take us to the Emerald City right now. No, indeed, returned Polly with a shudder. I hate cyclones anyway. Well, that's why I wanted to find out if you could do any magic, said the little Kansas girl. I'm sure I can't, but I'm sure, and I'm sure Button Bright can't. The only magic Shaggy Man has is a love magnet, which won't help us much. And don't be too sure of that, dear, said the shaggy man, a smile on his donkey face. I may not be able to do any magic myself, but I can call to us a powerful friend who loves me, because I own the love magnet, and this friend will surely be able to help us. Well, who's your friend? asked Dorothy. Johnny do it. Well, and what can Johnny do? Anything, answered the shaggy man with confidence. Well, ask him to come, she said eagerly. The shaggy man took the love magnet from his pocket and unwrapped the paper that surrounded it. Holding the charm in the palm of his hand, he looked at it steadily and said these words, Dear Johnny Do It, come to me. I need you as bad as bad can be. Well, here I am, said a cheery little voice, but you shouldn't say you need me bad because I'm always, always good. At this, they quickly whirled around to find a funny little man sitting on a big copper chest puffing smoke from a long pipe. His hair was gray, his whiskers were gray, and these whiskers were so long they had wound the ends of them around his waist and tied them in a hard knot underneath the leather apron that reached from his chin nearly to his feet, and which was soiled and scratched as if it had been used a long time. His nose was broad and stuck up a little, but his eyes were twinkling and merry. The little man's hands and arms were as hard and tough as the leather in his apron, and Dorothy thought Johnny Dewitt looked as if he'd done a lot of hard work in his lifetime. "'Good morning, Johnny,' said the shaggy man." Thank you for coming to me so quickly. I never waste time, said the newcomer properly. But what's happened to you? Where did you get that donkey head? Really, I wouldn't have known you at all, Shaggy Man, if I hadn't looked at your feet. The shaggy Man introduced Johnny Dewitt to Dorothy and Toto and Button Bright and the Rainbow's Daughter and told them the story of their adventures, adding that they were anxious now to reach the Emerald City in the land of Oz, where Dorothy had friends who would take care of them and send them home safe again. But, said he, we find that we can't cross this desert, which turns all the living flesh that touches it into dust. So I've asked you to come and help me. Johnny Dewitt puffed his pipe and looked carefully at the dreadful desert in front of him, stretching so far away they could not see its end. Well, you must ride. Wait, I'm sorry. You must ride, he said briskly. Well, what in? In a sandboat, which has runners like a sled and sails like a ship. The wind will blow you swiftly across the desert, and the sand cannot touch your flesh to turn it into dust. Good, cried Dorothy, clapping her hands delightedly. That was the way the magic carpet took us across. We didn't have to touch the sand at all. But where's the sand boat? asked the shaggy man, looking all around him. I'll make you one, said Johnny Dewitt. 
As he spoke, he knocked the ashes from his pipe and put it in his pocket. Then he unlocked the copper chest and lifted the lid, and Dorothy saw it was full of shining tools of all sorts and shapes. Johnny Dewitt moved quickly now, so quickly that they were astonished at the work he was able to accomplish. He had in his chest a tool for everything he wanted to do, and these must have been magic tools because they did their work so fast and so well. The man hummed a little song as he worked, and Dorothy tried to listen to it. She thought the words were something like these. The only way to do a thing is do it when you can, and do it cheerfully, and sing and work and think and plan. The only really unhappy one is he who dares to shirk. The only really happy one is he who cares to work. Whatever Johnny Dewitt was singing, he was certainly doing things, and they all stood by and watched him in amazement. He seized an axe and in a couple of chops felled a tree. Next he took a saw and in a few minutes sawed the tree trunk into long, broad boards. Then he nailed the boards together into the shape of a boat, about twelve feet long and four feet wide. He... he Sorry. We're never doing this again. <laughs> He cut from another tree a long, slender pole, which, when trimmed of its branches and fastened upright in the center of the boat, served as a mast. From the chest he drew a coil of rope and a big bundle of canvas, and with these, still humming his song, he rigged up a sail, arranging it so it could be raised or lowered upon the mast. Dorothy fairly gasped with wonder to see the thing grow so speedily before her eyes, and both Button Bright and Polly looked on with the same absorbed interest. It ought to be painted said Johnny Dewitt, tossing his tools back into the chest. For that would make it look prettier, but though I can paint it for you in three seconds, it would take an hour to dry, and that's a waste of time. I don't care how it looks, said the shaggy man, if only it'll take us across the desert. Well, it'll do that, declared Johnny Dewitt. All you need worry about is it's tipping over. Did you ever sail a ship? Well, I seen one sailed, said the shaggy man. Good. Sail this boat the way you've seen a ship sailed, and you'll be across the sands before you know it. With this, he slammed down the lid of the chest, and the noise made them all wink. While they were winking, the workmen disappeared, tools and all. And that was chapter 11, Johnny Do It Does It. Tomorrow night, we'll read chapter 12. It's called The Deadly Desert Crossed. So I think tomorrow night in chapter 12, they're going to cross the Deadly Desert. Um, tomorrow night, we'll read in a normal place with the phone stand so that we don't have all this ridiculousness. Look at my finger from holding it. Annabelle says her finger is sore from home. All that's on the camera now is your finger. <laughs> I'm done. I'm sending these people to bed. I'm going to stop. I just got hit in the head. <laughs> Do not appreciate this. We're not doing this in my room no more. We love you. Good night, Internet. Good night.